that I really love to be. Everybody who knows me knows that's not true. Um, we're going to be, first of all, I have to say, Lori Reynolds, if you are watching from home today, thank you for my size podium. <laughs> so some of us are not seven feet tall, like Pastor Doug. Um, so yeah, so thank you, Mrs. Lori Reynolds. I appreciate it. We, this morning, are going to take a trip back. So um, we're going to be in Habakkuk this morning. Habakkuk, however you want to pronounce it, pronounce it. I call it Habakkuk. It's probably not right, but um, this has been, yeah, trusting God in times of turmoil. And uh, this morning we're going to be looking at Habakkuk's complaint. Um, and then, uh, heh, spoiler alert, part two's next week. So I expect to see all of you here next week. There you go. Um, so before we get started, we're going to have a word of prayer and uh, ask God to unpack his word for us. Father, thank you for um, doing just that through the power of your Holy Spirit. Your word jumps off the page to us and you explain it to us. So God, I'm asking for you to do that today. Father, as we uh, look at this minor prophet and uh, what was going on, God, I just ask that you open it up to us and uh, show us how we can apply this today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Habakkuk chapter 1, and uh, we're going to start off um, reading and just uh, newsflash, I am in the uh, NLT version this morning. Um, I compared the two. I just like the way this one reads uh, compared to the NIV. It's really close, but I just, I just like it. So um, this is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. All right, we're going to stop right there for now. And I want to tell you a little story. So a long time ago, people left their homeland. And they traveled miles with many hardships to create a new home where they could follow God and not worry about persecution. Years passed. Compromises were made. Bad choices were made. Eventually, there was a split into two different places. They fell away from God and stopped following Him. How many think they know who I'm talking about? A handful of you. Okay, for those of that don't know, I am not talking about our country. However, how applicable is it? During Habakkuk's time, you had Israel in the north and Judah in the south. So if you remember um, when David, Solomon, it was one land and eventually it split. So Israel was made up of ten tribes. So we know because we've all been here on Wednesday and we've been following Pastor Doug in Exodus, we know that there was one nation, right? And there were 12 tribes. The south was made up of Benjamin and Judah. It included Jerusalem and the Jewish temple. So as you're reading through the Old Testament, I want to give you a hand. Um, I think I have this up. The order of the Old Testament. So right there. So we have the patriarchs to captivity in Egypt. So basically you've got from Genesis 
until they were in Egypt. And there's your timeline. Then you had, oh, and just so you know, books of the Bible, Genesis and Job take place in that era, okay? Because the Bible's not chronological as it's organized. So if you, if you try and read through and you think, oh, well, Daniel happened and then Jeremiah, you're in the same timeline with those books, okay? It's, this is important. Wilderness to conquest. You've got Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Ruth. Okay, so that takes place in there. And then period of the Judges. Guess which book that is? Judges. <laughs> and there's some overlap. So then we have the United Monarchy. So this is before where we're at right now. So that's your Samuels, Psalms, First Kings, First Chronicles, Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, and Song of Solomon. Then the divided monarchy, which is where we're at currently in um, Habakkuk. Second Kings, Second Chronicles, Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, Hosea, Amos, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Habakkuk. And then we go into exile, then we go into return of exile. It's important to know this because if you look at the United Monarchy, it was all under David, Solomon. Saul started it off because remember Israel wanted a king. Okay, They're like, oh God, we want to follow you, but we want an actual leader that we can go to. And yes, exactly. And complain. We want somebody we can complain to besides God because we already know when we complain to you that you're going to tell us we need to do things a specific way. And we're not happy about that. So what happens? We have the king and then all of a sudden Solomon dies and Jeroboam leads an uprising. Man of God leads an uprising. And now we have a split uh, kingdom. Okay, so now, for our intents and purposes today, we are in the southern king of, kingdom of Judah. Okay, so Judah was still led by the David lineage. Okay, they were still supposedly doing it right. Judah were the ones who were following God. Okay, this is where Habakkuk is. So as we look at the beginning of it, what's he say? He's in Judah. Okay, remember? He is in the city of God, the temple. He is in that area, and he cries out, How long must I call for help? And you don't listen. Okay, how many can relate to that? I'm crying out for help. God, I cry to you every day, and it just seems like you're not listening. <laughs> it happens. I mean, I do it myself. It's like you just you're really praying. So God says pray without ceasing, right? The Bible tells us that. There's a reason, and it's not because he's not listening. How passionate are you with what's going on in your life? Are you passionate enough to continually ask God and not know when he's going to answer? Sometimes he might not answer this side of heaven. How many have prayed for um, a loved one who's been on the deathbed? God, we just asked you 100% ultimately heal them, but then they die. Do you think God didn't answer your prayer? He answered your prayer because he healed them completely. And the only way that he could, because let's face it, because of sin, our physical bodies are dying. There's no way that's not going to happen. If you were thinking that you were living forever, I'm sorry to dash your thoughts. I, I, we're going to die. That's just going to happen. So Habakkuk's initial complaint is about the evil around him. Okay, We're, we're going to get going here in a minute on something else. But 
look at how he's talking to God in those verses. Okay? Just look at the context here. Um, You're not listening to me. Does it sound like he's pretty bold in his statements? God, I'm crying out. You're not listening to me. There's violence everywhere. You're not coming to help us. It almost sounds like he's saying, who are you, God? He's coming boldly to God. Did you know that we can do that? So I don't have this up there, but Hebrews 4, 16 says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. This is because we have a great high priest, Jesus, who is alive, by the way. Um, I heard a a good uh, message online the other day, and uh, he was addressing a question about who should we listen to? There's so many gods. There's so many religions. Um, There's one group that believe there's like 30,000 different deities. And so I thought this pastor referenced it very well. He said, okay, You have the choice of listening to someone who's dead or someone who's alive. Who do you want to believe? And that's what we have, folks. Jesus is alive. The word is his word to us. So he's alive, which means that word is good for today. The Bible is not obsolete just because it was written thousands of years ago. And we're going to see that. So, in our own lives right now, we can relate to what Habakkuk is saying. Um, We're coming up on, Tuesday, an election for our country. And I've heard all of it. Don't care about all of it. And here's why I don't care about all of it. Because God is listening. But what we're going to find out in a minute is we might not like his answer. Okay? So, America started out not as Israel, but kind of like it. They left England. These people left England. They went on a journey that had peril. Like, people died getting here. The reason they left is because they were being told they couldn't serve God. They couldn't worship God. They couldn't preach the way they felt God wanted them to. So they came here. That's how we were founded. We were founded by people who wanted a place that they could serve their God. Okay? That's how we started. And now here we are today. We have left that. We have moved away from that. And here we are as Christians and we're saying, God, how long do we have to cry out? Well, you're going to see in a little bit there's actions that are involved with our crying out. Okay? But how long have we been crying out, God, We see evil all around us. Is there anybody here who has not seen evil around you? Okay. If somebody had put their hand up, I would have asked where you were living. (laughs) Because it's definitely not here. We see evil all around us. And what we are asking, and some of us are asking, because as we see all this evil and we feel like God's not listening, what happens? Anxiety. Hopelessness. Fear, all this stuff comes into play because we feel like God's not listening. But he is. We ask, are we going to get wiped out? Okay? I don't think that's going to happen, and here's why. Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did Sodom and Gomorrah get wiped out? Can anybody? Somebody. They didn't have one righteous person, and everybody would be like, well, what about Lot? Lot wasn't living in the city. Lot was on the, I mean, he was keeping the gate. Let's be honest. But Lot, who it doesn't really say he was righteous, he was only saved because Abraham petitioned God and said, please save Lot. Okay? But there was not one righteous person found in Sodom and Gomorrah, and God judged them. God is going to judge America. It's happening now. He's not going to wipe us out, and here's why. 
You're here. Around the country, there are other churches meeting just like we are who are preaching the gospel. There are righteous people still in America, but here's what has to happen. Righteous people in America, we have a job. Pray, but there's action in our own communities. It's reaching out to people in our own communities. We're partnering with the mid main Homeless shelter. Why? Because they're helping people in our community. People with real needs. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to find who's doing stuff and get beside them. And you know what happens? We start affecting them. They may not be a Christian organization, but as Christians get into their communities and show Jesus to these organizations, we affect them. That's why it's important. All right, verse 5. Here's the Lord's reply. So Habakkuk's broken up. You've got his complaint, then you get the Lord's reply. Then he's got another complaint. How many times do we do that? Okay, God, you answered that, but what about this over here? Okay, so then he's got another complaint, and then there'll be another reply, and that's kind of how it's laid out. It's a little bit different from other um, of your uh, prophets. A lot of your prophets are prophesying. They go to the king and say, Ho! Oh! Like uh, with David. Nathan comes to David and says, Hey, so a guy in your kingdom, he goes and he kills this guy's only lamb. What should you do? Ah, oh, you should kill him. Well, it's you. So Habakkuk's a little bit different. He's actually pleading for the people, okay? But he's not prophesying to the people, all right? So just kind of lay that out. So verse 5, The Lord replied, Look around at the nations. Look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day. Something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I'm raising up the Babylonians. A cruel and violent people. What? Did you follow that? God's raising up a cruel and violent people to judge his people. But God doesn't do that, right? Well, it says it right here. They're going to march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers charge from far away. Like eagles, they swoop down to devour their prey. On they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn all their fortresses. They simply pile ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone. But they're deeply guilty and their own strength is their God. We'll stop right there. Um, so, God sees what's going on and he's telling Habakkuk, hey, take a look around you. I see what's going on. And I'm going to do something and you're going to be like, really, God? So like I said before, God's going to judge, but he may not judge in the way that we expect. Does that make sense? You follow that? Just like when you ask him for something, he may not give you the answer that you want. Because God's ways are better than ours. We may not think it. So, um, I don't think I gave this one to you either. Acts. And it is... Chapter 13. And verse 41. In case you want to get there as well. Look, you mockers. Be amazed and die. 
For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. Okay, so now we're in the New Testament and God is the same message. Okay, so now it's not just Old Testament. He's telling in Acts, look, I'm going to do something that you're not even going to believe. So if everybody, so Pastor Doug's going through Acts. So if you were Paul and you knew the ship you were going to go on was going to shipwreck and you're going to be like on an island somewhere stranded, would you go? Today, if God told you, hey, I want you to go here. On your way, you're going to wind up in deep trouble. Don't worry, but it's going to happen. Would you go? I, it's it's something that we all struggle. I a long time ago I was a teenager, and uh, we had a missions conference at our church, and a missionary said, "If God called you to the worst place on earth to be a missionary, would you go? How much faith do you have?" And I said, "I know that God will never call me there." I was a teenager, so I was still a little foolish. Um, and I had the belief that because I knew that I wouldn't go, that he wouldn't call me. So here's fast forward uh, Bible school. I'm in my 20s. And I said, God's not going to call me to be a pastor. And for years, I'm like, nope. God, I am not going to be a pastor. And we can all see how that worked out. So don't uh, think that just because you tell God, yeah, I don't have faith to do that, that he's not going to do that. Okay? Habakkuk is still saying, we're going to see it in a minute, <laughs> I have this complaint, God. Um, and now he's going to complain about God's answer. Has anybody ever done that? I hear some laughter. <laughs> Have you ever said to God, please just give me an answer? And he does. And then you're like, please just give me a different answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been there myself. Um, so, unfortunately for Israel, the nation, his people, God's first chosen people, the concept of God using nations to fulfill his purposes is a cycle. So if you look through the entire book of Revelation, of, yeah, Revelation, that's another really good one. We're not going to study that today. Um, if you look through the Old Testament, um, you have Israel praising God. Then we have Israel creating a golden calf, God punishing Israel. Then we have Israel turning back to God. Everything's great. Israel turns away from God. God punishes Israel. So we can see this cycle. There's a couple of things we can see. We actually sang about some of them. Number one, God is merciful. How many times did Israel turn from God and then God didn't wipe them out? Sure, he killed off some of those, the naysayers. We look at the, uh, they go into the promised land and you got 12 guys that come out, or 10 guys that say, Hey, we can't do it. Everybody's too big. And then you got two guys that say, God told us that we can do it. And who'd they listen to? The ten naysayers. And so they wander around for 40 years until the people who believe the naysayers die off. He didn't wipe out the whole nation, but he did take care of the people that said, no, God's not powerful enough to do that. So he's merciful. He could have just given up on his people and started over. Right? He created everything. He had the power to do that. He could have just said, like he did in the days of Noah, redo, wiped everybody out, started over. He could have just wiped out Israel and chosen somebody else. Or could he? How many remember a promise that he made to Abraham that your children are going to be my chosen people. So now there's a conundrum. He couldn't wipe them out because then he would be 
a God of non-promise because he made a promise. Well, he's made a promise to us too. And so he's not going to wipe us out, but he may make it painful because he wants us to have faith in him. How many times do we repent, start down a better path, and then go back the other way again? But how many times does God accept our repentance and forgives? And guess what happens at that point? He doesn't remember what we did. The Bible tells us that. Our sins are as far as the east is from the west. And it said that because you can't measure that. But we can, in our minds, we, oh, east and west. That's why he says that, because we can think about that. And that's a long ways, because you can't, the two don't meet. God continually forgives us because of the cross. Not because of anything we've done. But because of the cross, he continually forgives us. Habakkuk's second complaint, we're going to start in verse 12. And um, he almost seems confused. And then he further questions God's judgment. Because we all know the Babylonians are more wicked than Judah. So I, I picture Habakkuk as we're going through this. Think of Habakkuk, okay? Think of yourself. Really, God? This is your answer? So he says, and I need to get back there. Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you don't plan to wipe us out? O oh Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you are pure and cannot stand in the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? So, God, we're all evil, but we're more righteous than they are. How many have said that? that in their lives you don't have to raise your hand <laughs> how many times have we said um god really you're going to use that person for your will but i'm better than they are they're like they're horrible have you seen how they treat people um yeah well, how come you're using them are we only fish to be caught and killed? Are we only sea creatures that have no leader? Must we be strung up on their hooks and caught in their nets while they rejoice and celebrate? Then they will worship their nets and burn incense in front of them. These nets are the gods who have made us rich, they will claim. Will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquests? Habakkuk's trying to appeal to something that God doesn't have, that we as humans have and know so well, and that's pride. He's trying to butter God up, so to speak. God, our Holy One. I mean, look at how he's saying this. My Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you don't plan to wipe us out. That's a plea to pride, and unfortunately it didn't work because God's not prideful because pride's a sin. And as Habakkuk so purely shows us, God can't stand in the presence of evil. So Habakkuk seems to be calling out God by highlighting his holiness and how he can't look upon evil. We've seen this kind of conversation before, haven't we? So Wednesdays, they're going through Exodus. And how many 
if, if you haven't watched, I would encourage you to at least go back and watch um, Pastor Doug's messages through Exodus. So Moses is having a conversation with God on the mountain. And <laughs> this is after the golden calf. Everybody remembers that, right? Moses is gone. God's people. Ah, he must be dead. Build us something we can worship. And of course, Aaron's like, sure, because I don't want to get killed. So makes them this calf. God tells Moses, all right, you need to go down there and take care of your people. And Moses is like, oh, they're not mine. <laughs> they're your people, God. This is kind of that same conversation. You know, Habakkuk's reminding God who these people are. Yeah, they're evil and you should punish them. But seriously, these are your people. You're not going to wipe them out, right? And so you may ask about this today as you look at history. There's a temptation to blame God for not stepping in. Right? So God's actually given us more than what Habakkuk had. Okay? Follow me on this. Habakkuk had hope in what was going to happen. Habakkuk had Genesis, Exodus, all of those writings. That's all he had. Because remember, this is still before Christ. So there was no cross. And Habakkuk had a hope for a future where this was going to happen. And so because of that, he can talk to God in the way that he's talking to him. We have a hope in a past. It's already happened. We don't have to wonder if it's going to. In the Old Testament, there were many, many people who walked with God. Enoch walked with God and was taken up. He didn't even die. And how? Because he had that hope for the future. And that's what he served God with. We have a hope and a past that actually happened. We can come to God boldly with our concerns. But again, there's going to be some action required. God's current plan for us in our world today, okay? Because remember we said the Bible is still relevant for today. Jesus is alive. God is alive. His word's alive. It's relevant for today, okay? Matthew 28, 19 and 20, we find the Great Commission. This is after the death of Christ, after his resurrection. This is for us today, okay? And it says, go into the world, preach the gospel, create disciples, baptizing them, okay? So what does that mean for us here? This isn't, to send missionaries somewhere. Because he starts with in Jerusalem, and then in Judea, and then in other parts of the world. We get this backwards as Christians. We get this in that, okay, we're supporting missions, so we got the Great Commission covered. And I didn't put it up there. But that's not what he's telling us to do. Okay? So, um, I can't even remember if it was myself or Pastor Doug but I'm pretty sure we both have said this. We have an election coming up. Our job as Christians is to pray, seek God, and then vote. It's an action, okay? And I know there's a lot of controversy around it. I don't care. We're not called to controversy. We're called to pray, seek God, and vote. We are called to go into the world. It's an action. We're called to go out into the world. If you want change in your community, you need to actively be being the change. Habakkuk, we're going to see, uh, I'm going to stop with uh, chapter 2 and verse 1 because I like it. He says, I will climb up to my watchtower, stand at my guard post, there I'll wait to see what the Lord is going to say and how he will answer my complaint. Okay? So, we pray, we wait for that answer. That answer is going to come. 
If you are seeking God, get into the Word, seek God, that answer will come. That answer is going to require a response. Watching is an action. Praying is an action. Going is the other part of that action. We need to pray, seek Him out in His Word, watch and wait for that answer, and then respond to His answer. Does that make sense? Great. I'm glad it makes sense to you. I'm going to have the worship team come up. We're going to end a little bit early. I want to encourage you right now because I want to remind you what happens next. And we're going to cover the second part of Habakkuk next week, but the, here's, here's where the timeline that I gave you at the beginning makes sense. Okay? Babylon comes in. They do what God said they were going to do. They take over Judah. Okay? From that point, do you know what happens? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All of those stories that you know so well of God moving, God showing people who He is, happened in captivity. We grow in captivity. Captivity looks a little bit different. It could just be trials and tribulations. It's still captivity. You're, just, you're still in it. Everything that we learned about faith in the Old Testament happened in captivity. Exodus. They're fleeing captivity, but they're still wandering in the desert, which was their captivity. They were still in punishment, working, moving towards the promised land. Folks, we are right now not in the promised land. Did you follow that? We're not in the promised land. We're in captivity. But in captivity, we need to be going preaching the gospel, which is share your testimony. Tonight there's a concert and the lady that's coming tonight, Eveth Luna, has an amazing testimony. And uh, Ryan told me last night, 30 minutes, she shared her testimony of how God freed her from anxiety and from worry. Folks, God wants to free you from anxiety and worry. There's a lot going on in our world today, not just here in America, in our world that will cause you to be anxious and worry if you are not focused on our God who saved us. So prayerfully, I'm going to pray out, but prayerfully I would like you to just, you can stay seated, you don't need to stand, but I'd like the worship team, you pick, team. I'd like Christy and Heather to... Just play something, sing something. Huh? Hi, Isaac. Isaac's not singing, though. <laughs> um, and just, guys, pray. Ask God to free your anxiety over this election. Free your anxiety over where our country is. And then, this is twofold. Ask Him what you can do. Ask Him what He wants you to do in your community because that's where it starts. He says, first in Jerusalem. Uh, think about who he's talking to. He was talking to the people in Jerusalem. That's where we're supposed to start is in our hometown. So ask him to take off that worry, take off that anxiety, take off all of that because he has a better plan. We may not be happy with the plan that he has, but we have to trust and have faith that he knows what he's doing. He knew what he was doing here. He knows what he's doing today. So. And if you need to come up at the altar to do that, <laughs> it's open. But you can also do it right in your seat because God doesn't care where you are when you pray to him.
we are changed forever by your love. <laughs> I love that line. Not by anything that we did. We're changed forever by your love. God, I just ask as we go forward that you would help us to pray, get into your word, and then go. God, help us to affect the people around us, whether it's people that we work with, whether it's the annoying person in front of us in the drive through lane, whether it's someone that's just really being extra. God, help us to be the example to them. Help us with our responses daily. Help us to affect our community. God, we're not individually going to change the world, but individually we could affect our neighbor. And then that neighbor could affect another neighbor. And so on. And then <laughs> we're part of the change. So God, I pray that you would just help us through your spirit to do this. Help us to understand your great commission and what it really means. Help us to leave our anxiety at the cross. Help us to leave our hopelessness at the cross. Because God, you have a plan. And we know your plan is for our good. But ultimately, it's for your glory. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray you all have a great week. And for those of you who join us on Wednesdays, we have a treat for you. Um, Ryan Gagney is going to be sharing with us on Wednesday. So please, uh, if you don't come on Wednesday, it's, it's sure to be a good time. And uh, we'd love to see you. And have a great week.